Thank you. I'm going to use the mic so that uh, I don't have to strain for you to hear me. Uh, it was suggested that maybe I start out and give a brief explanation of why I'm up here talking about this. Some of you may not be surprised, some of you may be surprised to hear me talking about modeling. <clears throat> well, I'm at the back end of a fairly long career, although I'm no determined date yet for ending it, but um, I have worked in transit uh, most of my professional career. And a lot of that has been in a rather esoteric field of fully automated transit systems. Uh, the rest of the world is building automated transit for regional subways and uh, all kinds of things. Here in this country, we primarily used automated transit in airports. <clears throat> so what's evolved over time is that as I have looked at the application of fully automated systems in the context of the multimodal environment of major international airports, it's required me to develop analytical tools that are multimodal in order to understand that whole operational environment. And that's why 30 years ago we got started developing some analytical tools for our use in the study and design of transit systems, normally in the context of a high density multimodal setting like uh, major uh, airports. The result of that has been some fairly unique tools. <clears throat> and in fact, the, um, uh, they are, have been in our own little laboratory, uh, so to speak, of, of uh, airports around the world and more and more as time goes on in urban settings, but they are very different. And so I've used some unusual terms like holistic and multimodal, and there's a reason for that because I'm trying to distinguish and I'll be sharing with you some of the ways that they're different from conventional tools. Other consultants have used terms like voodoo software and things like that, so consider this voodoo software 101. Holistic has some interesting ramifications. First of all, it emphasizes the whole uh, and how the different parts interrelate to that. Uh, it's an analysis approach where you embrace many different moving parts in order to understand how they individually work as a subsystem and then how they work together as a, a whole system. And I'm going to use a presentation that actually you'll see me jumping around in, inside a much bigger presentation that I call my encyclopedia, but this will allow me to move to um, portions that are um, uh, useful. And my hyperlink, let's see if it works. There it goes. I always hold my breath because the hyperlink thing is kind of new. So let me start out, and this, this is the content that I'm going to talk to you about, and I'll in, discuss what each one means as we come to the uh, particular section. Multimodal transportation systems, of course, is a term we hear a lot of, but let me explain to you the context that I view this in as we look at analytical tools. First of all, we live in a very uh, dense urban environment. Here in Houston, it's not unlike other major cities of the world. And l first, learning how to gain access or to plan systems that allow us access and then to be mobile inside these dense urban settings is an objective that has been uh, my goal. Uh, this is a illustration about how there's many different types of systems or realms. I don't know if you can see all of that from the back of the room, but everything from, we're now talking about the mega region of Houston, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, down to the urban core where we have a, a number of dense urban districts. And the access to these urban districts is what I've been interested in throughout my career. Whether that's long distance access through um, trains coming from distances far away, regional access through corridors, the typical transit application that uh, we hear a lot about, or within urban districts, circulation systems that are designed to provide high levels of mobility. This is an illustration of this multimodal access to the urban core. And as I have been uh, working with uh, operations analysis of, of uh, urban settings, I have tried to continually 
work towards the point where I can embrace all of these moving parts uh, in order to understand the operational whole. Access transit may not be adequate in a lot of times to address circulation. Now, I'm just beginning to preach on this here in Houston more than I have in the past because we talk a lot about access to the urban core, but circulation within the urban core, I don't think we've begun to really engage. And uh, so allow me to make some reference to that, particularly uh, in the densest areas like the Texas Medical Center, uh, downtown, uh, uh, the uh, uptown district. So this is an illustration that, illust that talks about this circulation within the district that is uh, often referred to as the last mile uh, challenge. I gave a presentation here a few years ago talking about last mile issues with relation to uh, some of our major rail stations we're talking about for high speed rail. But this is just an illustration of that. So for an operational analysis to be comprehensive, you have to look at all multi multimodal elements, traffic, transit, pedestrians. <clears throat> you have to include transit modes that may be guideway specific. Um, they might be running in mixed traffic. They might be demand responsive. All the types of transit that we're familiar with. But an analytical tool needs to be able to embrace all of that. And then most importantly, the user experience uh, and how that is affected by the operational environment is an important uh, element as well to keep in mind. I'm going to skip over that because I'll show you a video of that in a moment. And I've talked to you about this particular graphing on holistic. So evaluation of all the modal elements is important when you're doing alternative studies. Most of us do some type of alternative studies. It might be an FTA type alternatives analysis where you're looking at different technologies to carry people through a corridor. It might be a different site locations where we're looking at alternatives between sites. But in all of these types of things in a transportation environment, the conventional approach does not analyze each mode or what I'll call a subsystem uh, equally. It tends to deal with some in great detail and some only in uh, a superficial manner. And this is a graphic that uh, originally came together a few years ago when we were scoping some work for um, Houston Metro. Uh, and I've uh, adapted it a little bit, but I've seen examples of this in the industry just in recent years about how the, an RFP came out and it specified that you were to use one type of tool for this mode and another type of tool for this mode and, and somehow you make them talk to each other and you hope that the assumptions are right between them. This is the conventional approach to multimodal uh, analysis. Whereas a holistic approach begins to group many of those together into a single analysis tool. We still recognize we have to interface with certain key things. Here speaking at uh, HGAC, I have to recognize we have to interface with the regional demand model because so much of the decision making is tied to that. Often uh, uh, city municipal governments have a favorite traffic signal analysis tool. You may have to interface with that. But a lot of the other things can be embraced in a single uh, analysis methodology. This is another description of the difference in what I'm talking about. The conventional approach, the four-step methodology is shown on the left, but what we've been striving for is a one-step methodology where all those different elements, trip generation, trip distribution, mode choice, and dynamic assignment are done in one operational analysis, uh, one simulation tool. And when you do that, it allows you a lot more flexibility in uh, time intervals you can study and the way you can uh, deal with multimodal environments. Another thing that's a popular buzzword is activity-based. One of my uh, modeler uh, colleagues in the company uh, um, mentioned the other day, we need to emphasize activity-based. Well, that's been an approach of mine for the last 30 years. What we have now that can be dealt with in this methodology is an OD trip table, often an extract from the regional model. Might be one way to bit trips assigned into the uh, model network a transport system schedule that might be a flight schedule or a train schedule. Another interesting one I've used in some projects just recently is a general event schedule. In, in the case I'm thinking of, it was a class schedule on a university where the input to the model was a class schedule and then it generated all the trips for pedestrian movements throughout the campus. Another example I'll show you later is a major sporting events where maybe 40,000 people are going somewhere at a particular point in time. And then finally, of course, land use base uh, trip generation. 
By holistic, I also mean that it is able to spread across multiple analysis uh, methods, I'll use that term, or, or level of detail. Uh, this is a technical presentation. Many of you, I realize, may not be technical modelers, so I'll try and keep it in the middle. But at times, I'm going to use words like macroscopic, mesoscopic, and microscopic. These are the different levels of computer processing that transportation models are using, tools are using. And what we've tried to do is develop uh, an analysis tools that embrace all of those in a single platform so that you can create bits and pieces with different levels of processing. I'll talk more about that in a moment. So holistic methodology, all modes are analyzed comprehensively and equally. There's one model for the four different steps. It's time of day trip generation for all activities using multiple different types of trip generation. Hybrid techniques that allow you to blend levels of analysis. And you're always dealing with a complete 24 hour day. In, in sequential time intervals in order to understand the way congestion builds and dissipates. So let me talk to you a little bit about the tool that we have developed. Uh, the acronym has been around for 30 years. The words have changed a little as we've uh, spread out from our initial work in just airports. Now we call it the Advanced Land Transportation Performance Simulation. Uh, it's a, what I consider a systems engineering approach it has integrated uh, a number of processing tools and data management tools to allow you to do scenario-based studies. We call them case studies. The popular term is scenarios that encompass all of the modes. And it has been in development for a long time. I'll talk to you a little more of detail about that later. In terms of multimodal, it embraces in a single trip assignment multiple modes as that's relevant. Here's an example. It happens to be from an old model of Texas Medical Center that we did 15 or 20 years ago, I think, um, where, uh, and I just use that as an example, um, where it shows that there's an, a driving component, a parking component, a transit component, and a pedestrian component. That's how we move through our urban environment. And so for, to really understand the experience of the user, and what choices he might make and how long it takes him to move through the system, uh, we felt it was important to embrace all of that. And then when you're doing competing, what I call competing travel paths that have all of these elements in it, you really are reflecting a choice somebody might make to use transit or not to use transit because of where he has to park or how far he has to walk. Those are all elements of that. Now, it's always important these days uh, to show you a little glitz. I'm going to give you a little taste of that, and then I'm not going to talk about glitz anymore. I'm going to talk about analysis. This is uh, just a, a little movie that um, is an example of how we can take analytical results and for presentation purposes bring it into a virtual world. This is purely presentation. There's no analytical benefit to this at all other than that the everyday person can understand it. So this capability is uh, well-defined. Uh, we've got a project now that we're, we're using that on. Uh, this was done a couple of years ago, and it's a nice uh, piece that was uh, for uh, work at LAX Airport. And it is today expected that you have to be able to present something like this should a project need it. But I've found many clients say, can you do that? Yes, I want you to do that, but then often they're not willing to fund the extra glitz because it's not necessary. So anyway, uh, just for what it's worth, I'm always told I have to show that yes, uh, that capability is there. Now let me talk to you the rest of the time about analytical horsepower, because that's what lights my fire. Features that are multimodal, uh, we can deal with different types of activity centers or urban districts. Uh, different types of uh, rail and transit systems, arterials and freeways, parking facilities, pedestrian systems. I'm going to give you a project tour that um, is um, a taste of several projects. And the first uh, graphic just shows how it can be used everything from planning to um, operational analysis. This is a set of project types I'm going to uh, talk about and show you a sampling of. And first, we're going to start out with a sports and entertainment venue. This first model sample 
is from some work we did in Minneapolis a few years ago. They were planning the new, uh, or designing the new Twins ballpark, and they hired us to look at the pedestrian environment outside the ballpark. Where did they need to put in grade-separated facilities? Uh, how are the people that weren't grade-separated going to interact with the traffic operations? And so uh, that you, the blue is a skyway system, so when cars pass by, they're passing underneath. This is looking down through multiple levels. Uh, but we're able to look at large quantities of people. Uh, it's an event type of uh, uh, activity. Uh, we're able to study um, the way people move through a combination of modes. And one of the points that's made in a moment is that it'll, it actually will select one of these little objects because every one of those little dots are moving um, uh, ants on this thing is a specific individual that's being modeled from a specific location to a specific destination. But we are able to look at a, a very dense multimodal environment. So here it's going to pick one of those. We call them people packs because they may be multiple parties. This one has three people in its party. I see the modeler didn't change it from the last airport model. He called it a terminating passenger. But anyway, it's a person coming from the, the ballpark. He's currently sitting in a um, in a uh, venue, a restaurant right there, waiting until he comes back into the system. Now the, the modeler selected a vehicle that's exiting from the event and it's just tracking him as he makes his progress down the street, showing uh, how fast he's operating at a point in time. Uh, and all of that is information about every piece of this is uh, being uh, tracked as, as specific trips uh, for information purposes. Let me show you an intermodal transit station. This is one uh, that uh, we've worked on off and on over the years at Newark Airport for the Port Authority. At the time they were designing the uh, Northeast Corridor Rail Station, we did some modeling for them. This is some years old. And we were looking at what would happen. And again, this is a multi-level looking down through all the levels. But what happens when these large trains arrive? This station serves New Jersey Transit commuter rail. It serves Acela high-speed trains. And all these people move over to a platform where they put, get onto a, a small monorail system that the Port Authority calls the air train that takes people into the airport itself. And as with the other uh, analysis, it's showing that this happened to be an originating passenger. He's at the NEC station waiting for the train to arrive. And he's fairly agile. He's, his average walking speed is about 230 feet per minute. Now, this is the campus environment I was telling you about. At, uh, uh, California State University Fresno, last year we did a study of a very um, advanced technology circulator system that there's only one or two of these in the world right now. Each of them is a small vehicle, it carries four people, and it's just showing uh, on the left there, it was momentarily the, what each vehicle is doing in its performance, accelerating, braking, opening its doors. And so we were particularly interested in whether this type of small vehicle technology can service the surge flows of a um, university campus. And so the, the tool was looking at how big the fleet size needed to be, how long people had to wait in order to be served. Um, this is a technology that it's demand responsive and once you get on a vehicle it takes you directly to the station where you're going. So all the stations are offline. What this is going to illustrate here is the effect of the class change. Uh, there are some people wandering around, probably uh, got out of class earlier or were making their way uh, from the library, and then all of a sudden everybody that's in class starts to pour out of their uh, campus, uh, out, of, out of their classroom building. And many of them are just changing uh, class buildings, uh, but many of them are going to the transit system, and so we're able to test this surge flow condition uh, in, a, in a manner that had not been done before. Urban districts are also very important. Uh, this particular one is Houston. We, this was a model that we did uh, a couple of years ago for Houston Metro. They had us specifically look at the pedestrian environment in downtown where the two rail lines are going to come together. Uh, it included the Main Street line that's running in a dedicated guideway as well as the new line um, along uh, Capitol and Rusk that's going to be running in mixed traffic flow. But specifically, we were looking at the pedestrian world, and you can see the pedestrians moving through the crosswalks there and along the sidewalks. A little bit later, I'll come back to this and give you more detail about the way this model was built. But this is uh, an example of a um, 
urban setting for, in a multimodal environment. The, um, there were other tools that we used, and a little bit later I'll explain to you how we used this tool to leverage the power of the other analytical tools as well. This was a 2035 scenario, by the way, long in the future. Hotels and casinos. There's a brand new development in Las Vegas. This is a graphic of it, the artist's model before it was built, because we were working on this particular uh, raised circular curb front in the, the architects in Las Vegas call this their porta cache operations. And we were testing the operations of this casino curb front. It serves as like a, a traffic circle because vehicles come up a ramp from the street below and then they circulate through and weave around each other. So I, I like to call it a traffic circle on steroids. But uh, the vehicles you see moving are moving into an underground down a ramp there. The, they are the valet vehicles that are being the jockeys come and they tend, the operation they have is they move them all at once. So we were studying the, the valet park operations as well as all the other maneuvering of vehicles. And then finally, airports. Uh, this is the model that was used a few years ago at Minneapolis Airport, the new Humphrey Terminal. I was not on the project, so I, I can't talk a whole lot about the details, but it, it is an interesting example of a pedestrian environment where there's high levels of processing of certain types. The different size circles at this zoom window are showing the different travel party sizes. And then you can see the ticket queues. This was a key importance to them because they were servicing a lot of um, types of flights that had um, uh, uh, a whole plane come all at once to be processed. Then of course we have the security screening area. There are meter greeters that are there waiting and they'll be joined up with other passengers as they come out through security. And then the baggage claim area uh, includes the space claim for a certain percentage of people that had not only bags but also had baggage carts. That's all an important part of a pedestrian analysis is to look at the total space claim. Now this is the last example in the video. This is a airport uh, that we had built the, the model of the terminal because we were studying this in uh, transit system that was going to be part of this development. That terminal is a mile long. It's in, Minne uh, it's in Detroit, excuse me. This is the Detroit Midfield Terminal. And what we used this model for was as a sampling of how we can look at evacuation scenarios. In the upper left is the clock time since the alarm went off. This particular scenario, people were not like a security being sent to the front door of the terminal out onto the curb front. They were being sent out the closest door get onto the apron. And after about 15 minutes uh, in the model, we set it up to where we dispatched a fleet of buses and we began to pick people up and carry them from their uh, hold area back to a safe location. And we were wanted to see how long would it take to really clear people off uh, of, a, uh, of, of an area that, that was not as safe as, as we need it to be. So the simulation, you'll see in the upper left, it clicks to about uh, almost two hours time. And then it picks one of the holding areas to look at the process of, of the way the occupancy was pulled down as each bus arrived uh, and uh, over the period of time. Those are examples of the way the analytical tool uh, is used in our normal course of work. Uh, these are some things I'm going to talk about, but I'm not going to go into much detail here. Let me jump to a discussion that talks about um, the user experience. Uh, Chandra, I was going to try and leave about 15 minutes for question and answer. Is that about right? Or Okay. Well, I'm going to move quickly. This is the uh, showing the uh, pedestrian experience where it's a complete street that we try and uh, uh, represent. This is a graphic taken from that Minneapolis um, twin stadium uh, model. We're actually using this same model to study another intermodal rail station on the other side of the, um, of the uh, ballpark. This is the example we looked at of downtown Houston. And as you can see, it's a rather large um, pedestrian environment. Uh, but we're able in embracing a large uh, overall area to get down to the street level as people interact with vehicles and trains and then we're able to, as an analytical tool, everything that's happening, every piece of this model is having statistical data accumulated 
And depending on the need of the project, we're able to go in and we're able to pull information. In the case of Houston Metro, what they needed to show FTA was what's the level of service going to be for the pedestrian at the corner of Ruskin, Maine at uh, 1115 in the morning. And so here on the left is the table that was an extract of statistical data of the corner of Ruskin, Maine, in fact, the northwest corner of Ruskin, Maine. And uh, it shows, uh, if you can see it, the uh, level of service here uh, for each of those five minute intervals that were a selection from during the middle of the day. A typical uh, model application for us in our, in our work. Each of those pieces, each, each curb section, sidewalk, each crosswalk, each travel lane has 24-hour statistical data accumulated. This one was for a pedestrian segment, uh, and I, I realize you can't read the legend here, but the green and black are the flow in and flow out of that segment in five-minute intervals. And where the green and black lines separate, like right here, it means that there was something happening that people were accumulating, and they weren't flowing out quite at the same pattern that they were flowing in. Along the bottom of that curve is showing the occupancy of that segment at the end of each five minute period. And uh, likewise, there's a separation of green and yellow because one is showing spa total space claim. Uh, people were carrying some things, so it was an equivalent occupancy greater than the actual count of people. Station access and wait time is important in transit work. This is a, a, a graphic that came directly from Alps for the different stations on the East End Light Rail line when we did a study of that a few years ago. And as you would expect, across the bottom is the time waiting for a train, and we were looking at six-minute headways, and this is the number of people. So as you would expect, the distribution of people waiting uh, is pretty evenly spread because of the way people arrive in random at a station, but there's one station that's different. And it shows a clustering at, of, of wait times. And the reason was because this was an intermodal station and there was a bus arriving on a schedule. So every time the bus arrived, everybody got off and went to the platform. And all together, they waited the same amount of time. And you got these interesting pattern of uh, clusters. Um, another example from that uh, Newark Airport uh, or, or Newark Airport study that I did just last year <coughs> um, was a look at a, a, the air train system that I'll show you a, a graphic in a minute, but it's connecting the Northeast Corridor Station to all the terminals and to the remote parking and the rental car. And as we looked at the people uh, activity on stations uh, around the airport district, there was one particular station. This, this particular wait time graphic is flipped and it's showing 100%. It's a percentage graph and the wait time up to 100% is here. And what was happening, that particular station occupancy, which is this graphic down here, was seeing a whole lot of people have to wait on the train. Very strange. Why would one station have that type of pattern? Well, as we looked a little closer, we were able to understand that at Terminal B, the outbound station, the problem was that the trains coming from the new uh, Terminal A, which was, we were looking at uh, the creation of a new Terminal A over here, the trains were so full that when they got to Terminal B outbound, the trains were, were full up and not enough people were getting off to let everybody get on. And so the people at Terminal B had this discomfort of the trains, they weren't able to get on the trains. They had to wait, some of them a long time. Interesting insight that would have been totally obscure if you hadn't been able to do a, an operational analysis of this type. Traffic operations, uh, I won't go through all this, but there's a traffic signal system uh, is important to represent in an urban district. I'm very pleased that the, our software development team moved from Houston about five years ago to Phoenix where they work, they're embedded inside a group that's doing software development for traffic system, traffic signal control systems. And so they're right in the heart of all of that and so we're able to improve um, progressively our simulation representation of that. This is showing the two different types of train operations in the one model you have the the streetcar type operation on the east end and southeast line as it comes across town running in the green band of traffic and you have the main street line that's running with signal preemption as it heads down main street there's other interaction like this vehicle is stopped because of the people crossing the street and when he stops he blocks the train progress so these are all uh, important um, multimodal uh, uh, aspects parking there's an issue in urban 
models about how you represent the place people really do get in and out of parking. And then when you do that, you need to also be able to connect the pedestrian going to parking and then the, the vehicle that re results. This graphic was also taken from our methodology document for Houston Metro, and what it's illustrating is that an, a regional model, in, in downtown Houston, we have a very detailed regional model because each TAZ, traffic analysis zone, is a city block. That's a very high level of detail. But what a, what a regional model will do is it'll generally find the closest intersection, and that's where it assigns the traffic, and they are bound uh, for whatever the destination is. Whereas the real world in a downtown environment is each of those city blocks has different buildings, and that building may have multiple ways to get out of parking, and it's not at the street corner. It's at the middle of the block so that you have all these turning movements that are critical to represent, but you can't draw that out of a macroscopic regional model. The classic approach is the traffic engineer looks at uh, turning movement counts, he plugs it in his spreadsheet, he scratches his head and said, well, in 25 years, things are probably going to change this way or that way, and so he makes some adjustments to the traffic counts, and that becomes his turning movements for a future condition. It's his best estimate, and we've tried to take a more um, uh, direct approach where we look at the trip assignments uh, in a much more detailed manner. I'll actually come back to that point in a few minutes, so hold the thought. In the case of the Minneapolis model, it included parking along with traffic and pedestrians, and built into the model was a pedestrian trip to an underground parking facility next to the stadium, and when that pedestrian arrived, it generated a vehicle trip coming up the ramps from below ground uh, into an intersection here at street level, and that vehicle was then appeared into the uh, traffic operations and uh, made its way to its destination. Another aspect of these models is being able to look at sub-regional scales. This was a model we built for TxDOT of the 290 corridor. We worked for about four or five years for them. Uh, this was an early model where we were looking at different uh, ways to try and mitigate the congestion in the 290 corridor. This is piece of 610 and this is Highway 6 out here. And these graphics are just showing different overall travel times through the corridor for different alternatives. You can see another curve here that was um, uh, where, where there were some TSM uh, solutions. This was actually looking at uh, operating conditions as they were a few years ago. Transit operations, I'm just going to skip through most of this. There's all kinds, of, as you can imagine as a transit engineer, there's all kinds of transit stuff. Uh, we can use a train schedule like a major rail station to, this is just showing occupancy of platform for different trains, some of the uh, scheduled data. Uh, we can create fairly detailed models of guideway segments. This was a, um, a circulator system that study we did for BART a few years ago to take people out to a uh, new urban district that was developing. The train propulsion systems are modeled in great detail because as a transit engineer, I need to know what power consumption is going to be, what, what the um, uh, RMS power draw is for a particular piece of the guideway, how fast a train is going to go if it has to accelerate, uh, up a grade, that type of thing. And then different types of control systems, and that's too geeky for me to even tell you about, but I'll just say the one on the left is a um, headway management system for one alternative, and the one on the right is a different kind of technology that's a demand responsive, uh, one of these small vehicle advanced technology things. But all of those are parts of, of the tool that we can use. So how do you use that? I'm going to talk about some of these things and then skip. Hybrid modeling. By hybrid, I mean that you have a technique that embeds a higher level of processing for certain strategic locations inside a more general, lower level processing model. It allows you to uh, process the model much faster. It gives you more efficient um, uh, analytical tool to use uh, and not just zero in on one little set of uh, intersections because that's all that, that you have any information about. Hybrid also deals with this multiple processing level. I mentioned it earlier. This has a little more detail. Uh, macroscopic, if you can read here, macroscopic is on a large scale for basic trip assignment, like a regional demand model. Mesoscopic is where you're often zooming into a sub-regional area and you want to track the movement precisely of every vehicle as it makes its way through the network. 
and microscopic is where it's actually using driver logic as vehicles maneuver around each other. So how is that used? The downtown model that we did for Metro. Um, let me compare with some typical tools. Houston Metro, understandably, has used the micro simulation traffic analysis tool called VISIM. And VISIM is a very good uh, driver logic uh, emulation and traffic signal emulation. So they said, we want the traffic study in downtown Houston to be VISIM, but we want you to study 25 years in the future. How are we, and the, the thing about VISIM is you, you build a model by at every intersection you tell it what percentage of cars go right and what percentage of cars go left and what percentage goes straight through. So to build a model of the morning peak hour for VISIM, you have to know turning movements at every single intersection. So the methodology we used, we knew we had to do the pedestrian model anyway. We built a hybrid model of, of all of downtown where it was a mesoscopic wrap. It was a mesoscopic model around the edges and it was microscopic in the interior. And by the trip assignment methodology where we were doing trip assignments dynamically in each time interval throughout the day, we were able to extract from the Alps model all the turning movements and build the VISIM model. And so by leveraging the tool, we were able to do a better job with uh, VISIM. But another demonstration of that hybrid that I did after we built the uh, downtown model was we, I added in to the same model all of the light, five light rail lines, future five light rail lines in their full performance. Uh, and the next graphic shows, um, for example, at um, 7.25 in the morning, uh, D11 train was stopping at the Newcastle station. And so this model is able to look in, in a hybrid way with some more mesoscopic general processing and some very detailed microscopic processing in the same tool, a hybrid. So what it allows you to do is do large scale models, higher processing speed, I'll give you an example. The VISIM model that was simulating a single hour of the day uh, took about an hour of processing time because of all that it's number crunching that it's trying to do. The ALPS model that was doing a mesoscopic wrap, a, mi a driver logic mesoscopic, microscopic core, pedestrian activity throughout downtown, and all five light rail lines took about three minutes of processing for the whole 24-hour day. That comparison shows you the, the power in, in hybrid uh, analysis. And uh, then other stuff here is, I'll skip all that. Scenario case studies. Uh, I'm not going to go into the level of detail I had planned just for the sake of time, um, but I can tell you that we have built the analysis tool off of scenarios. Um, these are, uh, I think the next graphic is a little more detail. This was a rail station in Los Angeles, um, uh, a commuter rail station, and there were different scenarios that we were looking at. These are the cases or the uh, case studies. And each of those case studies assembled a, uh, a ground transportation model and a pedestrian model and a demand scenario. And by just pulling together those building blocks, you run the case study and you look at the results. And I'm going to skip reporting features because that's just a bunch of tables and graphs. And I'm going to close out talking about large scale operational modeling. What do I mean by large scale? Our goal, and we're well along in the process, is to be able to do things like look at 100,000 or more pedestrians. The Minneapolis model was 60,000 pedestrians uh, with both a, a stadium event and a nearby uh, basketball arena event letting out at the same time. 200 or more square city blocks. We were actually 200 blocks that we were looking at in the Houston downtown. 100 or more discrete transit lines. Um, one of the examples I have of some work had 50 transit lines. I didn't show that to you, but uh, uh, we were able to do uh, very large scale. 100 or more miles of freeways in the entire region over multiple days in 15 minute intervals. This is what our objective is in large scale operational modeling. This was that pedestrian model I mentioned uh, of downtown Minneapolis. This was the example of uh, five transit lines, and I mentioned 50 transit lines in another uh, tool we've got. 
uh, large scale roadway models. This is actually a later version of the tech stop model where we were looking at the combination of freeway lanes, uh, service roads and arterials, Hempstead uh, Highway, Hempstead managed lanes, and commuter rail, all in one integrated simulation in order to give tech stop information on it, how are we going to put it all together to make the corridor work in the future. And then finally, um, we are at the threshold of using our tools to actually run regional models. This down below here is the regional, the official regional network that we have pulled into Alps. <coughs> and the TxDOT high speed rail ridership study that's scheduled to start next month will use this tool to study the metropolitan area for Houston Galveston, for Dallas Fort Worth, and we're probably going to combine Austin San Antonio and we'll be able to look at the multimodal trips to and from the intermodal rail station um, and and be able to give a level of analysis of what it's like at 8 o'clock in the morning versus 10 o'clock in the morning versus 1 o'clock in the afternoon that's a level of detail that uh, will make it a, make a difference in how people choose to use high-speed rail and so uh, we're excited about that and I'll be able to tell you more about it in about a year. Summary of benefits. Uh, these are the features of ALPS. Uh, I won't recount them, but uh, you can scan the list and see the things that I talked about. As an engineer, the last one is an area that I'm very interested in, the continue to develop power, energy, and environmental data. Because when you have this much statistical information, at every time interval of the day, and by different, every type of vehicle class, there's a lot of environmental p data that's a potential to be mined. <clears throat> Holistic tools, user experience, 24 hours, performance of each mode, uh, enable to look at failure or emergency evacuation. I didn't show you our traffic incident scenario representation for the sake of time, but uh, that's, that's a key part of what we can do to set up an incident anywhere for a certain period of time. How long does it take to recover? Study all of that. And then finally, uh, application to multimodal operations. Um, it's a systems approach. You're able to test all types of interactions through traffic signal systems, transit operations, look at future scenario conditions, and study special events and uh, incidents. And that is the end, and I'll be happy to take questions. Yes. I'm just saying. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Sam, so it seems like you made this huge jump, right? The processing time from hours and days on end of models running to, you know, three minutes. <clears throat> so the next jump is user interface, right? Is that the next leap for Alps? Because I'm not a modeler, and when I hear all this stuff, there's points where I'm like, oh, it can do that. But most of the other stuff I don't understand. Okay. So how do you get it to the point where clients like me can look at multiple scenarios with a couple of clicks of a mouse? Where, okay. where does that come in? Well, I, I didn't actually demonstrate a, a model uh, operation for you, but because it does process very quick, many models run in a, in a few seconds, depending on the type of model. Like the 290 model, it was actually a macroscopic model with the hybrid and demand and operational processing. Sorry, that, that's what it was. But it allows you to look at congestion effects. That model runs in about two seconds for a 24-hour day, and it processes three-quarters of a million trips. And what that allows you to do is set up a case study, run it, and immediately go and look at, uh, through color coding or charts and graphs, to look at level of service on different classes of, of roadways, uh, uh, delay time, um, TTI has made famous the travel time index. It's a, we, we built that in for a text dot to show it shows a TT, uh, travel time index uh, calculation by time of day. It's very utilitarian. And the reason we did it that way is because th we built this as a tool for us to use in our work. So you're still going to need a modeler to interact with the. Well, I am not, I don't consider myself a modeler. Um, I probably know more about why the methodology is the way it is than a lot of the modelers, but I'm not a modeler and I'm, I, I, there's a lot of things in the modern tool that I don't really know how to do. I have to call somebody and say, what menu do I pull down to click on this? 
but I know enough for looking through the results, and that's, that's not difficult. It's menu driven, it's point and click, it's uh, copy paste into a spreadsheet if you want to do something with some of the data. It's, it's very uh, user friendly. And it has to be for me to use it. Yes, ma'am. How do you inventory, <clears throat> or what methods do you use to inventory pedestrians? In, order for, in other words, to do a calibration, or, uh, or you mean internal to the simulation? You're modeling pedestrians. Okay. How do you count and estimate okay. their presence? That's a good question. The basic trip generation is by person trip. Uh, and let me use the example of a rail station. What we're going to do with TxDOT is we're going to get a um, schedule of trains that somebody has assembled as a future operating scenario, and we'll know the time that a particular train from, from uh, Dallas, for example, arrives at the platform and how many people are on it based on statistical data that's been given us uh, as a scenario. And when that train arrives, the model then percolates those people off of the train onto the platform. They'll make their way through the facility, down the escalators, out the front door or wherever to their uh, waiting car where they'll get in the car and the car will drive to the, whatever the boundary of the model is. Or they'll go to a parking garage and get in their car and drive away. Or they'll wait for the bus to come and they'll get on the bus. So pedestrians are purely part of the continuum of travel path assignment that comes from the person trip database. Did that answer the question? Well, I guess what it comes down to is your statistical data needs to be accurate. And then oh. the question comes to who developed the statistical data and any, how accurate is it? Any modeler will tell you garbage in, garbage out. Now here's what my experience has been. Uh, the next question out of somebody's mouth is, well, what does it take to calibrate it? Well, the answer I developed 20 years ago is calibration is a process. It's not an event. So you usually start with what data you have available. It may be pretty coarse in some aspects. It may be really detailed in others. But you assemble the data uh, that you have uh, that is part of it is used to generate trips, for example. And you build the best uh, model representation that you can. You're always able to get useful information out of it. And usually in the process of the modeler creating the detailed representation, he learns where, he knows where the soft spots are in the data on hand. And so the process becomes that you do a first level calibration. The next level of calibration that comes, uh, should you need to go to another level, is you begin to refine the, the internal pieces of the model that you've learned were more approximate through the means, through the process of developing the tool. And then you're able to go get strategic data collection that's more of a rifle shot and not a shotgun for the strategic data that you now know from the modeling process has more of an effect on the results than anything else. And so you're able to strategically define more important data that's too soft for your purpose and you're able to go get specific data. And through that process, there's a series of calibration steps that you can go to to the point where in anyone would say, yeah, it's calibrated. But you may not need to go to that level for many, many studies. It depends. Uh, and I'm sorry that that's such a convoluted answer, but that's the real world of modeling. Yes, sir. Well, let me follow up on that because that, that was exactly what I was wondering. Uh, as you get into activity-based or agent-based modeling, uh, I think we kind of begin to leave the realm of the observed and, and getting into almost more of a, a socio sociological study, i.e., uh, I think the, the uh, percentage of people that will be impacted in mode choice based on distance of parking lot is going to depend on how old they are or yeah. maybe other factors. Yeah. How, how do you incorporate uh, demographic or even attitudinal data into okay. the model? I'll, I'll, I'll give you a verbal response. I've got a whole section of the presentation I could go to, but I'm not going to do that. Um, I am most excited f about the future for mode choice. And that's a general term that I'll use as an example. If we were going to the other, if we were going downtown, we have a choice to walk, go out and get in our car, 
make our way out of parking, drive to downtown, find another parking garage, pay the price to go in there, walk from there to our destination. Or we can just go out to the street and we can walk to downtown. Or we can go out and wait on the bus, wait for the bus to go down, we may have to transfer, and, and we pay a certain price to do that. That's the realistic choice of going from here to downtown. The way the model represents that is we use a, what's called a logit algorithm. It's, it's a mathematical tool that's very standard, has been used for 25 years, that is a network solution type of uh, calculation. It's like an electrical, linear, electrical circuit. What's the impedance of this travel path versus that travel path? And the proportional amount of current that flows this way versus that way depends on the impedance to flow. We use a value of time cost. We use out-of-pocket cost, whether it's paying a bus fare or a parking revenue uh, fare. We use um, perceived cost to drive. We also have what we call social acceptability factors. It's another one of my little specialized voodoo terms that nobody else uses. And that's to represent a, the penalty of walking. If I have to walk 2,000 feet versus drive 2,000 feet, it's a lot less socially attractive to me to, to walk. So there's a higher social acceptability factor penalty to walking. And you, you have all these parts and pieces that are accumulated in the mathematical model that makes the assignment dynamically between how many people take this travel path versus that travel path. Now the travel paths may be dominant bus, dominant drive, dominant walk. Or they might be park remote and walk longer, pay less, park close in, pay more, walk very conveniently. The same mathematical algorithm will make that competing path trip assignment with all the modal parts and pieces. So it's a cost-based model where we convert time to cost. What about the old guys versus the young guys? or the rich man versus the poor man. You can create a special travel classification for representing the demographic of the guy who's probably going to ride transit no matter what because he doesn't own a car. And so that travel classification has its own set of trip assignments and its own value of time. His value of time may be $7.50 an hour. The next guy in a different travel classification demographically, his value of time may be $50 an hour or $100 an hour. So he's going to make choices differently. So we've tried to set up the model mathematically to be able to deal with all of that. Yes, ma'am. Did you include weather characteristics in that model? You know, I never have used that, but 20 years ago, one of my clients, in looking at the methodology, said, you know what, we could really represent a snow day or something like that. He was up in Chicago. But I have never had a client that needed that. When we, need, when we have a client that has a project that needs that, we'll do it, kind of the way we work. Is there another question? Uh, yes. Um, well, I see that your model can be applied in a, quite a variety of projects or um, analysis. And uh, what my curious is, uh, I have several questions. First of all, um, you mentioned that this model tool is good uh, for both small scale um, micro um, simulation and as well as a large scale projects. And um, I feel that uh, most uh, Modeling tools, they are good at uh, either large scale or small scale. For example, the regional travel demand model certainly is uh, more applicable to a uh, larger scale, scale like the regional um, travel forecasting. And then we see, we show uh, kind of a micro simulation tool are more, um, can provide more detailed information to the small scale projects. Mm -hmm. So um, as you mentioned, um, this tool can be applicable to both sides, um, but certainly, I mean, there must be some advantage and disadvantage um, when you compare um, its application to both small and This lady is a model, in case you didn't know. No, so. I'm just a 15% model. <laughs> um, my goal has been to, over the course of time, develop analytical tools that are very diverse in their use. and. I believe, and we're still on the journey, but I believe through hybrid techniques, when we built it all off of the same platform, whether it's the macroscopic model that does things in big chunks or the microscopic model that does it in little tiny pieces, if it's built off of a platform where 
all of those different levels can work together in what I call hybrid tools, I think it's possible, for example, to, to run a regional model that does uh, mode split, travel assignments, congestion effects throughout the large scale, but as you approach a more uh, defined area, you cross a boundary where it converts into a mesoscopic model that's processing more detailed but still somewhat generalized like highway capacity manual type of algorithms and then you cross another threshold as you get to the area of greatest concern and it becomes a microscopic analysis and you're able to look at great detail in the immediate vicinity of your study focus. The tools can be used as a, just a microscopic model as we did on the 290 study five or six years ago. They can be used just on a microscopic model uh, like some of the examples I showed, or, or mesoscopic. But my goal has been to create tools that were a common platform and able to be combined when it made sense to do that. And you have to decide if it makes sense or not on a given project. Um, also, I think that, uh, for the benefit of most audience, as I'm pretty new, we haven't uh, seen the real interface of the model. Could you just uh, briefly tell us you know, um, what kind of input usually required to develop such a model, okay. and uh, what kind of output uh, do you usually generate? And it seems like uh, you can apply it in different type of project um, where the input and output be different, uh, or you kind of uh, um, have some general output, uh, um, and then you can customize um, to develop different uh, performance measure for different projects. That's true. Um, let me just say, for the sake of time, and for all those that are not modelers here, I'm going to give you a two-minute answer, and then we can talk more afterwards. Um, a lot of the inputs are just spreadsheet data that are assembled in certain columns, you know, like this class schedule I mentioned for the university campus. They gave it to us as a spreadsheet, and ALPS read the spreadsheet. We just loaded the data into ALPS, it read it, and it processed the trip generation uh, from that. Uh, we do that for train schedules and flight schedules also, for example. The OD, mate, the OD trip table coming from the regional model is just an export from the cube model, and then ALPS reads that tabular data and processes it. Um, sometimes we have to create the, the segments using a CAD-like or a GIS-like environment that's built in, where you, you point and click, it draws a line, you, you hit enter, and then it asks, what's the attributes of that roadway segment? Well, it's this many lanes and so forth. So it's a GIS type of environment for creating much of the network. Or in the case of the regional models we'll be using for the TxDOT high-speed rail, we actually have already shown uh, and, and uh, prototyped the ability to read the regional model data set in a GIS format and suck it right into ALPS and it displays uh, the regional model with all the segment characteristics. So it, and, and since we write the software, if we need a special interface, we just have them do that. That's, that's a quick, simple answer. Yes, sir. Um, first of all, a comment. Fabulous tool. It's amazing. Um, what, um, if, you, if it, well, obviously, it's really just what it is. Yeah. <laughs> <What you're saying. laughs> um, kind of going on the question that was uh, started over here and then Jeff picked up on, how do you deal with uh, human non-rational decision making? <laughs> You calibrate for it, I guess. Well, I, mean, I assume that would be your, that would be your answer. But well, you know, let me mention this. One of the, because we, of the way we developed the tool, there is a synthetic way to calibrate the model. If you have some control totals, for example, of so many, we already know that we collected data and so many cars went past this point at this time of day, we have a methodology where we allow the tool to tweak variables we tell it it can, and it calibrates to match that control total. So maybe it's something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, the question is, uh, on some of the uh, um, other things that you were showing, it makes it seem like uh, you could uh, very easily uh, uh, measure air quality benefits as well. I, I agree. I've just never had a project to do that. We don't s write software to, s to tell the world it's for sale. We write software to perform our projects. And so when I have a project, I'm looking for the project that says, we need to pull some environmental data out of the model, and then it So I, I'm, the practical thing is I don't have somebody in the back room just saying, well, we could do this, and we could do that, and go in and programming. 
I look for a project that justifies the addition of that tool, and we do it. And I, I agree, it's, all the pieces are there. It could be done very readily. Yes, sir. Have you seen any threats in the hybrid model that having a greater level of, of process detail at the meso or microscopic level uh, can undermine the integrity of the macroscopic model? Any model has to be, you have to give it the uh, reasonableness test. And we have not yet combined all of those three levels. I think we're getting close to the point where we could, uh, and we'll have to evaluate that. Uh, but certainly, the more detail you get, the more accurate it is, and so you may, need, you may need a feedback loop that tweaks the regional macroscopic assignment based on what really happened in the microscopic piece of it. But that, that's, that is a legitimate question that someday we'll know the answer to that. <laughs> yes, ma'am. ALPS. It's called the Advanced Land Transportation Performance Simulation. Okay. You, know, you want to know what it meant 30 years ago? The Airport Landside Planning System. <laughs> Thank you very much.